Hi everyone, it's Miss Miller and welcome to our classroom channel. What if I told you that in Beyonce's album entitled Lemonade, in over the 12 songs, she had exactly 59 metaphors in her body of work combined. That would be so interesting to note. Well, today we're going to look at how to delineate literature through metaphors. And you will find that most artists actually um, use a similar tactic, and they don't just rely on one device, but they use many different um, examples of figurative language or rhetorical devices or figure of speech, however you name it, um, to sort of enhance their work. And so Shakespeare is no exception. Today we're going to do a case study as we look at, uh, closely at Macbeth. I think it's also important to note that there are so many variations of metaphors used in literature. The list is endless. Today I'm going to introduce you to five different types of metaphors and you're probably already familiar with the traditional metaphor where you can make comparisons using two different things that are not very much alike. Um, then you have the mixed metaphor and this is where you have more than one metaphor in a piece of work and it has like this ridiculous effect. The third type of metaphor is what's called an implied metaphor and this one sometimes is very difficult to detect because the author will only explicitly um, introduce us to one of the two metaphors and we have to sort of imply what the other one is or the comparison is being used. The next one is an extended metaphor, which you may have come across, but sort of didn't really even recognize it was happening. It definitely um, occurs at least once in Macbeth's um, piece. And this is the extended metaphor, where you have a metaphor, and it continues throughout the text. It may continue, let's say you have a poem, it may continue the comparison throughout the lines of the poems. Or it may also continue on the next page and in subsequent lines of a work. The complex metaphor is where you take one metaphor and then, um, or one literal meaning, and you sort of have several different um, metaphors for that just one. And then there are examples, or there's at least one in Macbeth's work as well. So we're going to take a look at what's called reverse engineering. And this is the technique I used to um, use when I would try to figure out whether or not metaphors or any type of figurative language sort of exist in a body of work. And so here are some signs that perhaps there are metaphors at work in a piece or literary piece. So for example, one is if the reading is particularly challenging for you. If you're reading it and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is so difficult. Um, I have no idea what I'm reading. And it's not just the diction or choice of words that are used. It's everything, right? It's not just some of it. Like sometimes we're reading a piece of work and we may not get a few words in it and we might be a little bit confused, but there's enough of the material for us to understand the meaning. However, sometimes we get through a page in a work and we have no idea what we've read. Um, another sign that there are metaphors at work in the literary piece is that it's one of Shakespeare's works. He is um, famous for using metaphors. Another one is the language is extraordinary. I've always been so particularly impressed by Shakespeare's language. Sometimes I'm like, what did he just hear? But it sure sounded beautiful. It's aesthetically pleasing to the air. And that's why it is so um, famous to, the, to this day. Um, the work itself is meritorious in nature. Um, this is a, a work that it, it should receive accolades and awards. Um, you have a proclivity to read it multiple times. So um, you might be inclined to say, okay, I'm going to read that page over. I don't know what that was. I'm going to read it again. Okay, well, let me read it one more time. Let's read it together, right? And then also another example that there are metaphors in a text, not just one, but a lot, would be the work is included in the literary canon. So um, literary canon would be what authors refer to as like the best works in literature. So what I like to do is move from metaphors to meaning.
And so the first thing you have to do in literature is recognize that there is a metaphor. And then you have to try to understand why the author made this comparison. Um, then you need to consider how this choice contributes to the development of the theme, the characters, the plot, everything in the text. And then you also want to analyze this, the effects that the metaphor has on the readings. So we're going to do our beginner case study in metaphors in Macbeth. And one of the first ones you see in Act 1 is um, where Macbeth sort of is responding to a couple of characters. Of course, of course we know that he um, received a prophecy from the three sisters or the witches that said that he would be Thane of Caldor, he would be king. And so his response is, the Thane of Caldor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? And you see Macbeth begins the play as a military leader. So he's very comfortable with that role and that position and those garments. Right? And so for someone to tell him you're going to be Thane of Caldor, he's thinking, okay, so why do you dress me in borrowed robes? This already belongs to someone else, right? So now he's going to be um, Thane of Caldor. He has actually three roles, right? He has three different clothes that he actually is getting in the text. One is the military garment, then it's the Thane of Caldor, and then he ascends to king. So when it says borrowed, he's taken it from someone else, right? So the comparison would be you, uh, the robes will sort of be comparing the clothing to his ascend to power, right? Or um, becoming king. There ultimately will be three kings in this text. So first there's King Duncan, which we know um, Macbeth kills, and then, um, or he borrows his robes, actually, and then, um, then there's King Malcolm, who also kills Macbeth. So you have these roles for, for Macbeth, and he has three different garments, and you'll see this extended metaphor because they refer to um, the robe or whatever he's dressed in or his clothing in a different way that sort of extends this metaphor of uh, the robes being considered um, something that signifies like his power or his throne. This next metaphor in Macbeth is what I like to call the seed effect. And so in this case, we have Duncan, who is talking to both Macbeth and Banquo. And at this time, of course, Mac, um, Duncan has no idea, or King Duncan has no idea, that Macbeth is not someone that he can trust. And it's clear in what he says to him. Um, he's very impressed, King Duncan is very impressed with Macbeth. Um, he's very proud of him, and he thinks of him as a loyal person or individual. So he says to Macbeth, I have begun to plant thee. He's comparing a seed to Macbeth, and he's saying, I've begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. He has no idea that he's already setting him up to take over um, King Duncan's throne right? But he's investing in him. He wants um, Macbeth to be his right-hand man. And so this is what he's saying to him. And then Banquo, obviously, he's, when, when King Duncan says this, he's also sort of implying Banquo as well. And Banquo is, is a bit more um, gracious. In his, in, in, and so in his response, it says, there if I grow, the harvest is your own. So he acknowledges that, gosh, you know, King Duncan, if you do invest in us, it, it's going to benefit you. So thank you, right? And so we're comparing or the comparison of the seed and the growth that happens to the characters of Macbeth and, and Banquo as well. I also like to um, use this example when looking at um, Shakespeare's Macbeth, and it's the chalice revenge. And so here Macbeth is sort of contemplating whether or not he should really go through with the killing of King Duncan or murdering King Duncan. So he says, this even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. And here, this metaphor, he's comparing the poison chalice, obviously saying like the same thing that I'm going to do to King Duncan, well, if justice is fair, then this is going to come back to me. This evil will catch up with me and he's not going to get away with it. So he acknowledges um, that that is the case, right? So there's the comparison there. If we look at, oops, 
So if we look at the next one, we have this one, which is no reason for the treason, right? Macbeth says, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only the vaulting ambition, which overlaps itself and falls on the other. So here he compares himself riding a horse and he has the spur and he obviously he used the spur on the side of the horse to, to, to um, motivate the horse to go faster. So he compares the spur on the side to um, what is motivating him to go through with this, this plan to kill King Duncan. And he says, I don't have any reason. I just like, I, I, I don't have any reason to uh, prick the sides of my intent, but only vault in ambition. So it's just to be king. And that's not good enough reason And in, in terms of his contemplation. Now, this next metaphor I like to refer to as Hail to Macbeth. Remember in the very beginning, even the witches um, said, Oh, Hail to Macbeth, Hail to Banquo. Well, in this case, um, it says, I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of opinion, uh, people. So golden opinions is actually like his reputation. And so everyone is so um, excited by uh, Macbeth. And, and he's happy by you know, the kings um, being so proud of him. So I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn. Again, worn. If you recall one of the original slides, I mentioned the first metaphor, which is borrowed robes. And so here we have this extended metaphor because it continues with worn. So, you know, the clothing is being compared. In this case, it's being compared to his reputation now in their newest gloss, right? So his reputation, um, it's, 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 which will be worn now in the newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. So if he goes through with this idea of killing King Duncan, then this won't last, obviously, this, this feeling that he has. Okay. okay, so we have this Lady Macbeth taunt. And so it looks like I'm actually covering up part of the slide, so I'm going to um, remove myself. But Lady Macbeth um, is talking to Macbeth, and she says, was the hope drunk, right? So she's comparing, like, hope, right, to being drunk. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself, had it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale? Again, dressed right so here we are with this extended metaphor first we had um borrowed robes and we had worn this reputation and now we have dressed right so dressed would be referring to this role as king and so lady macbeth is if you recall um macbeth is sort of contemplating whether or not he should do it he sort of talked himself out of it and then now he says you know i do want to indeed um you know, kill um, uh, King Duncan. He goes back and forth. And so Lady Macbeth is getting frustrated with um, him and, and begins to taunt him and, and you know, refer to him as a coward and even um, sort of questions his mass manhood. Was the hope drunk? Like, were you, did you not mean what you said when you said you wanted to be a king? When you dressed yourself, had it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale? So, um, the comparison here again is the dress, his clothing, to um, being king. And so the last drop is this metaphor, and Macbeth is is talking of the you know he's just killed um, King Duncan, and you can see in the the backdrop there, there's King Duncan, he's dead, and the blood, right? It's a, it's a it's a bloody mess. It's red, just like the the color of the wine. The wine of life is drawn. Right, we know that um, wine has a life, uh, right? So the wine of life is drawn; it's over, and mere less is left this vault to brag of. So this is not something that he's proud of. He's feeling um, bad about it, but the wine of life is drawn; it's over. He's dead. King Duncan is done. Right. So that's that comparison. Let's take a look at the lamb complex. And so oh, there's a lot of things going on here. It says to offer up the weak. So this is Malcolm talking, and he's actually talking to, I believe it's Macduff. And he says to offer up the weak, poor, innocent lamb. And so Malcolm is saying to Macduff, I am this weak, poor, innocent lamb. And he recognizes that Macduff may indeed sacrifice Malcolm, right? He may kill Malcolm just to keep 
Macbeth happy. And so he even compares her to appease an angry god. And the angry god that Malcolm is referring to is Macbeth. So um, this is what I like to call the lamb complex. He recognizes that he is this innocent lamb. So we have another one, which is uh, Malcolm, later in the text, and he's, he's talking to Macduff, and he says, Be this the news that Macduff's family has been slain, the whetstone of your sword. So it's important for you to note that a whetstone is what um, Malcolm used, or most people, anyone, uses to sharpen their sword. And so if you look at the image there, it's to sharpen the sword. It makes it sharp, right? And so um, someone has just come and given the news that um, Macduff's family, his children, his wife, his servants have all been murdered at, at, the, at the hands of uh, Macbeth. And now Macbeth didn't do this um, directly. He, had, he sent someone else to do it. So Malcolm is saying, be this, right? And there's the metaphor. It's coming, the whetstone of your sword. Use this this anger and, and, and pain and suffering to fuel you um, sort of getting taking care of Macbeth. Use this in the same way that a whetstone is used to sharpen a, a sword. Use this pain, use this anger to fuel your action, right, into killing Macbeth. And so in... Towards the latter part of the text, we see in Act 5, Scene 2, uh, Caithness. Um, this, is, this is a, a rather interesting metaphor. Use, meet we the medicine of the sickly wheel, and with him pour we in our country's purge each drop of us. A lot of things happening here. Okay, so for example, we see this um, map of Scotland in the, in the background. And so um, when it says meet, we the medicine the medicine or the cure in this case is malcolm and of the sickly wheel and it also says country that's scotland so everything has gone horrible in scotland so malcolm can fix it and with him poor we so all the soldiers uh Caithness, everybody's gonna back him up in our country's purge each drop of us each one of us will have your back in getting um macbeth and so that's what this one is about. And then we see, you can see him saying, enough. We see this sort of mental deterioration of Macbeth. Um, he says, out, out, brief candle. And this candle serves as a metaphor too because it doesn't live, it doesn't, you know, live long, right? So life's but a walking shadow. Here's the first metaphor. This is like, there's several. Okay, it's like a, a compound or complex metaphor. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more, right? It is a tale. There it is. There's another metaphor. It is a tale. This one's a little bit more explicitly stated. It's not something we have to figure out, but there's just more than one. It's a tale told by an idiot. So um, he's... You know, Macbeth is sort of saying what his life is now, right? It, it's it's in, it's chaos. It's a sh it's a walking shadow. He's comparing life um, to first a candle, then life to this walking shadow. It's a poor player. It's this amplification of a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and his hour. This is all he has, right? And then is heard no more. He's gone. It's a tale. Now, what's interesting here is told by an idiot full of sound and fury. What's interesting here is that um, sound and fury is actually a title of a text. And so I have it um, here. Um, and, and it's also, it's a tale to, um, of, of nothing, signifying nothing. Too. So this completes our case study on metaphors in Macbeth. And so today, I ultimately, I shared with you the different variations of a metaphor. I also explained this re idea of reverse engineering, where you can detect whether or not you've got um, a lot of metaphors at work in your literary piece. We looked at how you can move from metaphors to analysis. And then finally, I shared with you all nine examples that are used in uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth of metaphors. So I hope that was helpful and gave you a better understanding of how to um, examine a metaphor in a work. And of course, if you can dissect and delineate metaphors in Shakespeare's work, you can evaluate it in any piece, any literary work that you look at. I hope that was helpful. Thanks.